Today, we're going to be taking a look at the second part of this little two-part series that I've decided to put together on the front end of getting back from my sabbatical. Last Sunday, we took a look at the church and what does doing church look like here and the, and the responsibilities and the importance of having good leaders in places of ministry. We also looked at here at Just Discovery Church, we don't want to be a top-down organization, and yet we do need structure. So there's got to be a balance between the two. And so the thing that we've come up with is to say, hey, look, we want to have low control over what we do here from the leadership structure, but high accountability. We believe that people need to be held to an accountability standard that Jesus would hold people to and hold people to their goals and objectives that they want to help, and we want to help you along in that journey. But it all comes down to doing these three things that are in front of us, discovering God, growing together with Jesus, and blessing our community. That's the function of Discovery Church. We focused it. We've narrowed it down. We've decided that we're going to be and, and have an emphasis on certain things, and these are the things that we have chosen. These are our core values as a church. And I think it's important for us to visit them yearly, if not reg more regularly than that, so that we stay focused on what we're doing, so we stay clear in our own minds as a congregation what it is that God has called this church to do. And today we're going to be taking a look at the fifth of those values. This is number one, that's number two, that's number three. Last Sunday was number four, and today is number five, and which is kingdom expansion. And kingdom expansion is basically the idea that we believe that we're not here alone, that the church of God is bigger than Discovery Church. You've maybe heard me say this before, that we minister with other Christians in other places, that we want to participate together in doing the work of God broadly, that we are a part of the church, not our, just our church, that the Catholics and the Protestants can work together, that the Pentecostals and the United Church and the Anglican Church and the CRC can work together for the good of the kingdom of God. Amen? Yeah. Amen. All right. Woo. Woo! But it's more than that even as well, because the momentum, the movement of the church must begin with a belief that we can work together, that we're bigger than just this community of people. The momentum, the movement of the church has to start with that aspect, but then it has to move itself. If the church doesn't move, it entropies. If anybody's been, had their arm in a cast, they know what entropy is. You take the cast off and your arm is weak. If there's too much structure, too much constriction, too many rules around the church, it will entropy. It happens all the time. And it breaks my heart when I drive through our community and I see the churches in Bowmanville, some of them that are smaller today than they, they were 10 years ago when I got here. Discovery Church is one of only a few of the churches in our community that are actually growing. And we believe in this vision and core values of Discovery Church enough to put our money where our mouth is, to put our people into the process and to passionately uh, move people towards the goal of completing, discovering God, growing together with Jesus, and blessing our community. But movement requires addition and multiplication. When I drive around the city and I look at the community in which we live, just in Bowmanville alone, 32,000 people are, are in our community. We have a population that is growing by 6 to 7% a year. But the churches are shrinking by the same amount per year. Now, we are fortunate as a church that we're not shrinking. And it's not just by people coming to us from other churches. It's by the believers themselves, you as God's people, drawing others in and encouraging them to just give it a chance. To talk about this Jesus stuff somewhere, some way. To have an opportunity to invite someone to participate in a small group. And that's why next week's sermons and messages are so important for you to grab onto. To take that little uh, green sheet of paper in front of you that was in the program and read the blurb to understand what it's about and share that with people. I know every one of you, either yourself or someone else that you know is struggling in a relationship. And there's someone that drives them crazy. And God's word can be a place where they can find wisdom and hope. So I pray that you bring them back. One of the things you got to know about me, though, as your pastor, is that I'm typically bent this way. If you haven't guessed that already, um, you just need to know that. But 
over the course of my life, and especially here at Discovery Church, one of the things that some great people here have continued to press me upon and push me into and remind me and hold me accountable to is that my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is first and foremost, I'm not a doer, I'm a beer. I'm being with Jesus my being with him, my time with him, my relationship with him is of utmost importance. And it's out of that that I do for God, not the other way around. Because if it's only about doing, then we're about rules again. And it's not about our relationship with Jesus Christ. You and I as a church, we together as a church have a responsibility before God for all of the talent that sits in this room. I don't know if you know this or not, but you are an extremely, extraordinarily talented bunch of people. You are gifted beyond what you might have imagined. People look at Discovery Church and they can't believe the kinds of things that we are able to accomplish with this many people. They look at us and say, you've got how many worship teams? Four? You've got four full worship teams? We can't get an organist to show up on Sunday morning. How is it possible that a church of 350 people can't find an organist and yet you have 150 and you've got four worship teams? How is it possible that you're able to do ministry in this community to the extent to which you do it when you're only such a small group of people? And I keep telling people, we have an extraordinarily gifted bunch of people. Amen. Yeah. But with that comes responsibility. With that requires us to act and to live out of the giftedness that we have been given. So I'd like to share with you a passage of scripture. I'd like to share with you this story that Jesus tells. And like you, you and I both know that stories are powerful in communicating ideas. You've gone to any movies lately, 12 Years a Slave is one good example of that. That when you go, there's a message there that they're trying to communicate to you that is just done so wonderfully through story. And Jesus used stories all the time to communicate truths. They called them parables. And in this section of the scripture that I'd like to share with you, Jesus is at the end of his ministry. He's getting close to the time when he's going to be crucified and he's going to go up onto the cross. And he's walking through the temple courtyards with his disciples. And he starts to weep. He starts to cry, literally in front of his disciples. And he says, oh, I wish that I could gather these people as a hen gathers her chicks. And spare them from what's about to come. And the disciples' eyes must have gotten really big and said, what's about to come? And Jesus looks at them and says, this temple, these buildings that you are so enamored with, this structure, this edifice of the church, the temple of God in Jerusalem, will no longer be here in 70 years. It's going to be torn down. Well, Jesus didn't say 70 years, but he said it's going to be torn down. And we know from history that 70 years, 70 AD, that's exactly what happened. But he was also looking at his disciples and getting them prepared for the idea that he was going to go. And he knew that by going, he wasn't going to be able to be present to do the work that he had been doing, but he would have to do it from heaven through us. And so the whole chapter 24 of Matthew, chapter 25 of Matthew, is Jesus' sermon on the Mount of Olives. We call it the Olivet Discourse, if you're into that kind of thing and you want to categorize some of that stuff. He's sitting on the side of the mountain on the Mount of Olives, teaching his disciples about what's going to happen between the time that he leaves and the time that he comes back again. And he wants them to know that it's not just about saying yes to Jesus, getting saved, so to speak. It's about living this Christian life, being a follower of Jesus from now until the time that Jesus returns. And he tells four parables, four stories to help us understand what we're supposed to do in the meantime. That's you and me. He talks about being ready. He talks about being prepared. He talks about doing something with the gifts that God has given us. And that's the one I want to share with you this morning. He's looking into the disciples' eyes and saying, you are an extraordinarily gifted bunch of people. And you have been given gifts and talents. And you've got to use them. The passage of scripture starts this way from Matthew 25 in verse 14. And I'm just going to ask uh, Jordan or um, Johan, if you would just kind of walk through this one verse at a time with me, I'm going to stop and we're going to take a look at these verses. So just kind of uh, listen for my cue again as we go from one verse to the next. It starts this way. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going a long trip. 
He's called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. So first of all, I want you to notice something about this verse. Jesus is telling a story about a man who's going away. Well, we know from looking back that he's talking about himself. He's going to be going away. He's going to be crucified. He's going to raise from the dead. And then a few days later, he's going to be raised into heaven. And he's going to disappear. And so he's getting them ready. He's looking at his disciples. as I'm looking at you and saying, pay attention. I'm not going to be here for very much longer. And he called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. And then he left on his trip. So Jesus, looking at his disciples, and they're not dumb, right? They're listening, they're paying attention, they're getting the idea that he's probably talking about us, and he's going to go away and leave us with these talents, these bags of money. The original language uses the word talent. This translation translates that into bags of money, or bags of silver. And if you looked at this financially, this would probably be in the neighborhood of $2 million for the guy who got five bags. Now, you can imagine an employer who says, look, I'm going away to open up a European office. I'm leaving you in charge, and while I'm gone, you have full authority to make decisions while I'm away. While I'm in Europe, I'm going to send you information. I'm going to communicate with you by email, but I'm going to come back, and when I do, be ready. And then he comes back. And this is the rest of the story. The servant who received five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. So you've got God giving gifts, or the father, the story, the the landowner giving money to his representatives based upon the gifts that they have. It says that based upon in proportion to their abilities. You and I both know that some people are just have more capacity than others, right? Uh, I look at Billy Graham or Franklin Graham, and I am amazed at what they're able to accomplish. Guys like Rick Warren, uh, even Barack Obama, uh, people uh, you know, across the globe who have this enormous capacity for leadership, abilities that I wish that I had. And you also know that there are people with lots of other different levels of capacity. And then there are those who have little capacity. God gives each of you gifts based upon your capacity. He looks at you and says, I'm going to extend to you talents, resources, money, uh, intellect, emotions. I'm going to give you natural talents and abilities. I'm going to give you spiritual gifts as well. And I'm asking you to use them in proportion to your gifts in proportion to your abilities. God is not asking you to do anything more than what you've already been given or do anything and be represented with more than what you've been given. It's a portion to your gifts. But here's the thing I want you to notice. Each one of you is responsible for the gifts that God has given you. And this last servant decides that he's not going to do anything with it. Now, some of you have been in this situation before, and at least you've been in this situation at one time in your life in the past, and maybe you're in the middle of it now, where you've been squandering the gifts that God has given you. You've had opportunities to serve in some place, to take care of a neighbor in need, a family member who is destitute. You've had the opportunity to walk alongside someone and encourage them, to give money to an organization, to help out in certain places, to be a friend in need when you were called upon, and yet you step back. And you buried that gift in the ground. We've all been there. And I'm no different than you are. But I want you to see what happens next. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. Ooh. Ouch. The master's coming back. Jesus is going to return one day. And if I had to put a little summary sentence for my whole message today, it would be this. Live as if Jesus is coming back tomorrow. Plan as if he's coming back in 100 years. 
Let me say that again. Live as if Jesus is coming back tomorrow, but plan as if he's coming back in 100 years. Because if we live as if Jesus is coming back tomorrow, we're less likely to squander or to bury the gift that God has given us. And it's also an encouragement to us to use every last effort that we can for the advancement of the kingdom of God. The servant whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I've earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I earned two more. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. And then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops and didn't plant, that I didn't plant, and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit the money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. I think sometimes churches or Christians have a false view of our Heavenly Father. Jesus never described himself in any way, shape, or form, nor did our Heavenly Father describe himself in any way, shape, or form that would correlate to that description, the servant with one talent. And I, yet I think that some people walk into a relationship with Jesus with those very poor understandings of who God is. That God is this tyrant in the sky, this big ogre who wags his finger at us, the cosmic policeman who wants us to feel like the rules and regulations are the thing that we have going on for us. Or that old grandfather in the sky who's permissive about anything and really anything can happen. And we have these mixed up views of who God is. If you want to know who Jesus is, who our heavenly father is, look to Jesus and you'll know what our heavenly father is like. Jesus wants us to live our lives with the talents and abilities that he has given us to the fullest extent so that we might receive that good and faithful servant designation that the landowner gave his servants. Good and faithful servant. Wow. Let's celebrate together what you've accomplished. And as churches, I think that we have the very same responsibility. We can see this microcosm in ourselves about our talents and abilities and the spiritual gifts he has given us and my natural abilities and my money and my time and my family and my job. But we can also see this in a bigger sense as our church and even in a bigger sense as the body of Christ corporately. And what saddens me to no end is churches that have got such a mixed up view of God that they become entropy, that they bury the gift in the ground. And we don't see the expansion of the kingdom of God. It's your and my responsibility as individuals to work together in this group of people to be the representative that steps forward into that place where we say, here is what you have given me, Lord. I hope that you're pleased with what I've accomplished. You see, I believe with absolute clarity that we are not a church of one talent. We're not even a church of two talents. I believe firmly that we are a church of five talents, of five talents representing a church with an enormous capacity, a church with a lot of abilities, and we are going to be held responsible to the abilities that God has given us. And you can see the impact of that in the way that this church has done and been and still continues to strive forward to do as God has asked us to do in the world around us, to connect with individual people. And I want to say thank you, good and faithful servants, for the work that you do here at Discovery Church and in our community. There's an aspect to this that I want to kind of camp around. Just very briefly as we close. I think that this 
passage, this parable, this story reminds us that we are going to be held account for the gifts that God has given us. Not believing that we are a church of one talent, but that we are a church of five. And that God is going to ask us, what did you do with what I have given you? I believe with absolute clarity and deep within my soul that we can be leaders to our community. That not only as a church can we do great things, but we can help other churches do great things. That there is amongst this group of people the capacity to take on a leadership role for others. To be able to share with what God has done. And as a new church in our community, we have a unique opportunity to be able to try and develop new ideas. And if they don't work, toss them out and try something else. And share with our churches in this community about what does work and how we can encourage the kingdom of God to grow and expand. I think that you and I have a unique opportunity to step into this even more fully. And you're like, really? Are you going to push us more? (laughs) Yes. Because I think you have it in you. I would love to be able to see you join with us as we begin the new ministry year and programs and small groups and growing in your faith and knowing that first and foremost, your relationship with Jesus Christ is the most important thing. But getting involved in expansion of the kingdom of God is so, so important. I want you to hear what happens when we don't use our gifts. And remember, I'm not saying that we're the church of one talent, but that we're the one with five. But I want you to hear what it says. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given them and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Throw this useless servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I think it's part of our responsibility to make sure that never happens. Because we are so gifted. I think it's part of our responsibility to step alongside churches in our community who are suffering and who are having a hard time because you have been gifted and help them not lose the talent that God has given them. And I think it's our responsibility as a church to continue to expand what we do here and expanding it by reproducing. I had a conversation uh, with some of you who came to our members and regular attenders meeting last May and talked about this idea that we are coming up with at Stonewood. For those of you who don't know, know what that is, that's a long-term care facility here in our community. There's a chaplain there. Her name is Pastor Elizabeth, and uh, she's a full-time chaplain. By the way, only one of three. I'm chaplain in a long-term care facility. And she has a unique opportunity to grow a ministry opportunity that we talked about. And we sat down today, or this earlier this week, and we went through it. And Allie Shore, who's, uh, I don't see her, she was there, and we talked a little bit about it. I got so excited, and I want to share with you what's going on. We want to start a missional community, a group of 20 to 40 people that gather together from other churches as well as ours, but bring leadership to this because we've done this before, and adopt an entire group of people in that place. It's what they call a home area, or you can call it a floor or a wing or whatever you want to call it, but they call it a home area. And by adopting the residents, the staff, and the administrators that look after this group of people and their families, that we begin a journey of getting to know and serve and be a blessing to that community. It's already underway. Elizabeth is so excited about this. She's got a group of people who want to start a leadership learning process with us as a church as we, once again, encourage you to get involved in small groups and missional communities. You're going to see them next week. The Hub is a missional community. The Cakewalk that Betty Van Dyke does is a missional community. It's a group of people that are gathering together on a journey of just doing life together with an opportunity to share what God is doing. Live to Be is a perfect example that Robert shared with us earlier. It's all about sports. It's all about fun for the kids. There's no Bible content on the Friday night when they go play sports. But then they go play paintball, and they have some fun, and they gather together and build relationships. And out of that, Robert says, six people went to the Billy Graham crusade this weekend. 20 kids showing up for sports night leads to six kids going off and hearing the gospel. That's what a missional community does. If we adopt this floor, this home area, We can be a part of potentially being there when someone needs to hear the good news. 
And you've got maybe baggage around this idea of evangelism or kingdom expansion. I want you to try and put that aside for a minute and just recognize that what this is about is walking alongside people, people that you know and some people that you don't, and building relationships with them so that they trust you enough to share what's going on in your life. Really, that's what this is about. You have an opportunity next week to step into stuff like a small group, to be a part of the ministries here at Discovery Church. I believe with all my heart that within a year, year and a half, we're going to be too big for this facility and that we're going to have to start meeting twice on a Sunday because you continue to bring and to encourage people to check out what's going on at Discovery Church. And as new people come to know the Lord, we're going to have to move to two services. I believe with all my heart that in the future, sometime in the future, I don't know when that's going to be yet, we're going to get so large for two services that we're going to have to start doing church in Newcastle. And that the hub is going to grow. And this group of young adults that worship together is going to turn into a church. And we're going to have church on Sunday night. We're going to have two churches on Sunday morning. And possibly in the future, we're going to be worshiping in Newcastle. Are you dreaming, Martin? Yeah. I am. But it's based upon the fact that I believe we have the capacity. That God has given you the gifts that we can grow, that we can encourage, and the ability to attract new people to this wonderful, glorious message that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And that through forgiveness and through that relationship with him, people get to know who he is that they get healed, that their lives are made new, that character is changed, and that love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness are a reflection of who we are as God's people. That's what's going to motivate us. Not some preacher that stands up front, not great leadership, not any of that, although all of that's needed, but it's because of what God is doing in you that continues to do in you as you respond in kind by using the gifts that God has called you to, to see this church grow and walk alongside churches in our community and start new churches in our community and see the kingdom of God expand and grow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's such a big dream, and I'm a dreamer. But Lord, you have given us so much. You have given us an enormous gift with the people that sit here today. And I pray, Lord, that you would remind us to fan into flame the gift that you have given us, the gift of the Holy Spirit that moves our hearts and our minds to continue to serve, to love as Jesus loved, to grow the kingdom of God. And Father, I now pray that you would continue to bless Discovery Church as you have so abundantly done so. I pray this with all my heart, in Jesus' name.